You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. You're listening to the Dave Bullis Podcast. Podcast. With me today is Kelly Baker. Kelly has actually worked in Hollywood for over 20 years uh, as being the sound designer for some of Gus Van Zandt's most prominent movies. And additionally, Kelly is also an independent filmmaker and he's also an author publishing two books on the subject of how to make your film and sound design. Kelly, thank you very much for joining me, sir. How are you? Good. How are you doing today, Dave? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. It's uh, Actually, it's not too hot out here in Pennsylvania. Yeah, we, we have a, re- a brief respite here, too. <laughs> uh, excellent. So, so Kelly, um, you know, if, if you could, could you give us your, your background? I know I kind of touched on that in the intro, but could you want to detail about your background a little more? <clears throat> sure. Uh, I, I am originally from Portland, Oregon, but I went to USC's film school. I was lucky enough to get back in there back in the late 70s, mid-70s. Uh, and at USC, I got both my uh, bachelor's degree and master's degree in film production. I returned to Portland because I believed in independent filmmaking. I was the editor and sound uh, editor on a film called The Adventures of Mark Twain for Will Vinton. It's a clay, animation, clay animated feature. And it was working on that film that I met Gus Van Zandt. Uh, he was working for Will as well, a uh, short stint. And we became friends, and I ended up being the sound designer on My Own Private Idaho, even Cowgirls Get the Blues, which we had to do twice, uh, To Die For. I'm trying to remember all these now. It's early in the morning, right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me, To Die For, Good Will Hunting, the remake of Psycho, and Finding Forrester. And then I worked with Todd Haynes on Far From Heaven. And all the time I was uh, being the sound designer for those guys, I was also making my own films. So I've written and directed eight short films, which have been seen all over the world. Uh, And I've also uh, written and directed three features, a whole bunch of documentaries. And when I had my production company going for a while, I've directed commercials, corporates, educationals, music videos, you name it. Um, but so that's kind of me in a nutshell. I walked away from the sound design stuff uh, probably 10 years ago, and I do nothing but my own films now, uh, in addition to teaching, doing workshops on occasion, and uh, writing books. Oh, excellent. Excellent. And I actually have both those books in next to me right now, uh, which is part one, which is you know making the extreme no-budget film, and then part two, which is sound uh, conversations with uh, sound people. Yeah, unsound people. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's right, unsound people. I didn't <laughs> They are kind of, you know, they're, they're amazing sound people, but they're all a little crazy. So that's where we get the unsound people. <laughs> you know, I just actually got that. I can't mm. believe I didn't get that before, but. <laughs> no problem. So, I think that was, I probably wrote that joke more for me and the people that are in the book than anybody else. <laughs> but it, it is a, a really good book. And also it is probably the, the largest book on sound design I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, as a compliment, I swear. Okay. Maybe we should sell it by the pound. <laughs> it was, I, I didn't realize how long it was until I got to the end, yeah, end of it as I was writing, and I was like, oh, man, there's a lot of stuff here. Yeah, because I actually am comparing the two books right now, like, and, and your second book is like twice the size of the first book. I, and mm-hmm. I'm like, wow. So, cause, you know, I never really noticed that, and I was going through it. And, um, you know, there, there is one thing I want to touch on, too. There's something you said, and it said um, you said sound can invoke images, but images can't invoke the sound. And I think you were quoting somebody on that, but mm-hmm. you know, I, I think that, that I, I never really, uh, you know, uh, thought about like thought of it like that before. Mm-hmm. But you know, uh, is, could you, if you could, could you ever, you know, uh, could you uh, right now just embellish on that a little bit, or just you know? <clears throat> well, sure, and I think that it's Gary Rydstrom, the sound designer, who said that. Um, <clears throat> Don't quote me because I can't remember, but I think it's Gary. <laughs> he and I had this dis- had this discussion, and <clears throat> kind of what well, what I like to say is, you know, if someone very close to you passes away, uh, how do you want to remember them? Would you like to remember them with a photograph, or would you like to have a recording of their voice to remember? And I think if you have the recording of the voice, it brings up all sorts of other memories. 
and in all sorts of other visuals, if you will, about the time that the two of you spent together, hung out together, whatever it was. And it can be funny, it can be sad, but listening to someone's, uh, recording someone's voice does bring back all sorts of images. Whereas after a while with a photograph, I, I think uh, that <clears throat> this images can fade. You know, you don't, you look at the photograph and you can't hear that person anymore after a few years. You can't visualize them as well as you once did. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I, yeah. And, you know, I, I talk to a lot of students or a lot of filmmakers all the time and, you know, and ask that very same question. And Gary does too, you know, which would you rather have? And interestingly enough, most filmmakers who, you know, claim to be visual people uh, <clears throat> all say, well, God, I'd like to have the, the voice recording. Uh, and I think that sound can take you back to places uh, in your life. I mean, we've all been watching something and a particular song comes up in a movie and boom, you know, we're right back to, you know, it, it creates all sorts of emotions inside of us because of our memories with that song. And, and you know, something else you said um, uh, kind of resonates with this also is that, you know, uh, people will tolerate bad uh, uh, visual, but they won't tolerate bad audio. Right. Um, you know, I still pull out, you know, the Blair Witch Project or films like The Celebration, the Danish film, which I think is brilliant. Um, and, you know, they're handheld. There's no lighting. I mean, they look like crap. But people watch them and they're glued to them. And part of it is because you can understand everything that's going on. And I think that when you go to a theater and you're watching something, and this is probably back in the old, old days when we actually projected film, you know, if the projector was out of focus or whatever, you went in, you complained, they focused it, they backed up, and they showed it again. But if you went in and the sound was all garbled, you walked out and you wanted your money back. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's an interesting uh, thing. But, you know, if you can't, if, if someone cannot understand the dialogue in your movie, you're screwed. You know, I actually made my uh, my student film. I you know I I don't have a major. I didn't go to school for film, but um, I, I actually shot a student film, and one of, and I just had a bunch of random filmmaking books to guide me along. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I made sure to do was I, it, it was one of those throwback corny parody movies, so sure. to speak. And uh, as I learned when showing rough cuts to people is always going to make sure the audio is good and even when i use like the special effects or when i was doing like um you know foley sound or whatever mm -hmm. i had to make sure that I, I had to go backtrack a lot and they were like oh the visual is good but they were like you know uh if it's you know obviously it was bad it was rough you know but they I had to go back and make sure i had that studio quality sound which i was able to actually get because i had a, a bunch of sound effects on on uh on CDs from different programs and sure. going back and actually you could actually see how much people actually cared about sound uh, more so than I ever thought. Well, there's a quote that uh, I like to use all the time, and I always say that the only people uh, who care about sound truly are the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I said, they will walk out if the sound is bad. They will, they they won't watch your movie. A friend of mine who uh, <clears throat> is a creative director at a film festival. Uh, he always says that, you know, when he's watching films, he's always trying to make sure the sound is good because all it takes is one person in an audience to say, what did he say? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've lost the audience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with short films, it's really, really crucial because, you know, you've got a very short period of time to engage the audience and to get everything across. Yeah, very true. Very true. Yeah. So, so, Kelly, um, you, you started The Angry Filmmaker. Yeah, which is, you know, your brands and, you know, you have your site, angryfilmmaker.com. I actually right. am wearing this shirt right now. You can't see it. <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, I, I swear I'm wearing the shirt. And so, 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 you know, where did the Angry Filmmaker, where did that come from? And, you know, why did you start that brand? <clears throat> one of the one of the jokes about all this stuff is, that, you know, everybody thinks that I named myself that. But it was actually a bunch of other filmmakers who started calling me that. Uh, and so I was kind of uh, <clears throat> named the angry filmmaker. And a lot of it has to do with um, my work and my attitude about independent filmmaking. Uh, and part of the whole thing with this that I, I'm very concerned about is, you know, angry, or angry filming. Independent filmmaking is alive and well. There's a lot of independent filmmakers. A lot of people are trying to do this. But independent film distribution is dead. 
it is so hard once you get your film out to get it on to see it and to make any money doing this because ultimately we need to support ourselves. Um, and I get really angry with places like Sundance and South by Southwest and a lot of these larger film festivals who really aren't. I mean, if you look and see the films that are playing there, it's a lot of connected Hollywood people. Mm -hmm. or connected New York people. And that's all well and good, but it's not really independent. And who goes up there to buy the films at those places? It's all the um, major distributors and the mini majors. Uh, and so, and like I said, it's getting harder and harder for us to get our work seen. And it's harder and harder for us to get paid for our work. And there are some amazing films out there the most audiences will never, ever see because, you know, most theaters won't book us. Uh, there was a time and uh, with Netflix um, streaming now, it's different. But when Netflix first started and it was nothing but the DVDs, they wouldn't deal with independent filmmakers. You had to have a distributor. Yes. And, you know, once you sign with a distributor, for the most part, good luck seeing any money coming back. And I'm not saying that distributors are dishonest. Um, because I could get sued by saying that. Uh, you know, I have too many friends who've had distribution deals and they haven't made any money. Uh, and so, and that's why I self distribute everything. Uh, because, you know, I know where the money goes. I know what I have to spend to get my stuff out and I know what comes back in comes to me. Uh, and it's still a real, real rough road to home. My third book is on self distribution. Um, and I've interviewed a bunch of filmmakers who distribute the films themselves, and they tell me how they do it, and we all do things differently. But so, you know, I, I, <clears throat> the angry filmmaker thing is I'm angry at uh, independent film distribution. I'm also angry at so-called independent filmmakers who are trying to get a Hollywood deal. Mm. If you have a $5 million movie, that's not independent. You know, I, especially when you've got a couple of stars in it. I mean, really independent from what? Uh, and so, you know, I rail out here against uh, phony independence and I rail against, you know, not being able to get our work seen in a lot of different places. It's changing slowly um, because I've been doing this for 15 years being angry. <laughs> uh, you know, so it, things are changing. And uh, Sundance now uh, finally has a little section up there for films that were made, I think, under $100,000. And that's about fucking time. You know, if mm -hmm. they want to call themselves independent, they should have done that years ago. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I just had uh, Elliot Grove on last uh, podcast, and he uh, had, runs Rain Dance, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, right. that's what, it, what he, actually we were discussing too was how much money should go into it versus you know, if it really is a truly independent film. Oh, excuse me, right. if it truly is an independent film as opposed to uh, you know the, the guys who come in like, oh yeah, this costs you know twenty million bucks, right. so. Uh, so that you know, and Elliot was awesome and uh, made a lot of good points because you know, yeah. film festivals now, as you see, when they you know when they start, they usually have certain you know goals in mind, and then then they gradually evolve to like, oh, uh, now we just want you know this type of film or that type of film. Right, right, and the whole well, that whole thing is interesting. And Raindance is a great festival because they do really look for films that you know are small budgeted uh, and all. But there's a book out on distribution uh, that I won't mention the name of the the fellow who wrote it. Um, but part of it is you know he talks about you know he got his film into this big film festival, so they immediately spent fifteen thousand dollars to hire a publicist. Well, shit, man. Who's got fifteen thousand dollars to hire a publicist, especially after you've got after you've gotten your film made? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of us have made our films for thirty, forty thousand dollars or less. I mean, I've got two features that I made for under ten thousand. Where are we going to get fifteen thousand dollars to hire a publicist just to promote at one film festival? Yeah, you know that's ridiculous, man. You know, and uh, in your next book on, on, on distribution, uh, mm -hmm. are you going to cover crowdfunding by any chance? Well, it's on. I'm going to talk a little bit about crowdfunding, but since it's on distribution, uh, my angle on crowdfunding will be to get money to distribute the film. Okay, yeah, that, that's but not, all. But not crowdfunding as a whole thing because yeah. that's that's a whole book. Yeah, well, yeah, I just thought if you tie it in because I, I know I, I some some of my friends who are filmmakers have actually done that. They've actually done Kickstarters or any people right. just distribution and making the right. uh, if they don't if they do decide to actually make a Blu-ray or DVD or just go all digital. 
Yeah. But uh, but yeah, that, that, that's you know that's great advice. So you know, Kelly, just to transfer into your first project, which was Bird Dog. Yeah. And you know, could you take us through that whole process? Because again, the theme of, of this whole month September for all the film, uh, filmmakers on this podcast is you know making your your, your movie and focusing right. on really making your first film. You know, could could you take right. us through that through Bird Dog when when you were first you know at the beginning, which is writing the script. Right. Well, the whole thing is I can't uh, I can't start with Bird Dog without starting with my short films. Okay. Because I wrote and directed eight short films before I made Bird Dog, and to me this is this is the important key. I needed to learn how to make a film and to keep an audience engaged. And too many filmmakers want to jump straight into making a feature. They make a feature, and it's a lot harder than anybody thinks. Uh, but the film, the feature doesn't turn out well. And, you know, you've spent money, you've had friends help, you know, I mean, on and on and on. So I always tell filmmakers all the time, start with short films. And uh, my first, uh, and my whole group of short films, I think nothing was over seven minutes in length. Um, because by doing the short films, I concentrated on the writing. I concentrated on how much can I shoot in a day? How inexpensively can I do these? And how many locations can I do in a single day? And all of those truly helped me when I finally made the switch and jumped to uh, making a feature, which was Bird Dog, the first one, um, <clears throat> because I knew my craft better. Because, you know, we have to remember that filmmaking, first and foremost, is a craft. And the more you do it, the better you get. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when it came, then I had, you know, all these films that had done well in film festivals uh, and had been shown on television stuff. But I had all those behind me when I finally said, OK, now let's make the feature. Uh, and, and like I said, I can't emphasize enough to you and to other filmmakers, start with short films. I know we all have this feature and the features are glamorous. Start with short films and really learn what you're doing and how to put a film together. Because it's really hard to entertain an audience or to keep an audience for 90 minutes or 100 minutes. It's also really hard to keep an audience for 7 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, so practice, 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 I guess is what I'm saying. Then with Bird Dog, for me, it all started with a script. And before I even started casting, I had written 13 full drafts of the script. And then I started casting. And I think we did, I did probably another four or five drafts between casting and finally uh, finishing the shoot. Because I was even rewriting on set when you find out there's things that go your way and things that don't. Um, but make sure that your uh, script is airtight it won't be, but make it as airtight as possible because that's writing the script is the cheapest part of making a movie. And if you don't get that right, you know, then, then you're going to be in trouble, truly. But I wrote about something that I knew and I wrote about places that I knew because I knew I could get those uh, locations. We didn't pay anything for locations. I made a donation at the old folks' home, at the old folks' community center. I made a donation. Uh, to the center. But for the most part, all the locations were places that I knew and places that I knew I could get. Um, I shot that film in 35 millimeter uh, back in the old back in the old days. That was 90, 1998, as I recall. Uh, and, you know, my last feature I shot in digital video. So financially, there was a huge difference. Uh, I think I spent twenty eight thousand dollars just on film stock. Now, that doesn't count processing it or transferring it or any of that stuff. It was $28,000 just to buy the film stock, and I only had so much film. Uh, and so I really, really had to know exactly what I was shooting for every scene. Uh, and one of the things that I do with uh, my films is I rehearse like crazy. I will With the features, I would rehearse for probably two to three months before we'd start shooting. Because it's as far as I'm concerned, I want the actors to know everything they need to know before they even set, step on the set. <clears throat> so we rehearsed like crazy, and I knew with the budget that I had, I couldn't afford to, you know, I could do take three, and that was probably as crazy as I could get. If I couldn't get what I needed by take three, I'd have to move the camera and try it from a different angle, whatever it was. But so I had to, <clears throat> I had to be very, very disciplined with how much I could shoot for each shot, which meant that my DP and I, we, I can't draw for shit, um, but we would do uh, lighting diagrams and shot lists, and that's how we did everything. And we had a list every morning, this is this scene, and we're going to do this, this, and this. And these are the different shots. 
and the organization on a feature is is has to be pretty phenomenal. I mean, we shot for eighteen straight days, not straight days. We took well one day off a week, but so it's three weeks of shooting, and every uh, the night before uh, each day of shooting, you know, we gave the cast and the crew the. Uh, <clears throat> the forms that said, this is what we're shooting tomorrow. This is where it's going to be. So everybody knew ahead of time, you know, what was going on, what was happening there. And then organizing, cause I had bird dog was the biggest film that I'd had done. I had a cast of 28 and a crew of 30. Since we were shooting a film, I had two five ton trucks. One had all the lighting and grip equipment with a generator and the other five ton had all the camera equipment. Uh, and so it was like moving around a small army. So there was just a ton of coordination. The the great thing with that is that we were so well organized. I, you know, the actors were so well rehearsed that we could move quickly on the set. And if someone came up with an idea, hey, what about if we try? We had the flexibility we could do that. Uh, and especially if an uh, actor gave me a performance uh, that was a little different than what we've been working on. And then it's kind of like, you know what, let's follow this a little bit farther. Um, so I think the whole thing with Bird Dog was truly that uh, it was all about the organization and the script. Uh, and I think that that's why that film did so well. So now when you, for your team, so when you were planning this out, how many actual crew members did you have behind the scenes? Meaning like did you have a unit production manager or did you have uh, like a producer helping you along? Or yeah, I had a producer uh, with that. And since I had been – <clears throat> making commercials and doing some other stuff. You know, I knew all the crew people in town. So um, we did have two uh, production managers. Is that right, two? No, we had one production manager. I'm sorry. It was, we had two on the other film. We had one production manager. We had the producer. We had an associate producer. And then, you know, we had, I mean, because we were shooting film, camera and grip was huge. Uh, as far as people and, uh, you know, set, uh, my set designer, my, uh, wardrobe person props. I mean, you know, so it was, it was a lot, a lot of stuff, but yeah, 30, 30 people was, it was, you know, when I originally set out and thought I'm going to make my first feature, what I had originally thought about is I'd probably shoot in 16 millimeter and be me and three friends in the back of a pickup truck. And somehow this thing just kept growing <laughs> until, you know, it became what it was. So, you know, when when you finally cemented the script, then how did you know when it was ready to start shooting? <clears throat> you know, it just it felt ready, and with all the rehearsals and everything else, the actors, it, it felt like it was making sense. And, I, and here's the deal with it: I felt the script was ready, but even then, we start shooting, and things come up in the acting, and things come up, <clears throat> and so I was rewriting on the set too. And the interesting part about the film is, you know, because your film is never cemented, truly. Your, film, your, your script is never finished. We got into the editing room. We cut the film together, and the ending just petered out. The last big scene just didn't work. It started off like gangbusters, and then it just kind of took a nosedive. And I thought, well, wait a minute. It read great. It acted great. I mean, everything. But when I put it together in the editing, and I brought a friend of mine up from L.A. who's also an editor, we went, a guy who I went to school with, and he came up to look at my rough cut and he spent about a week <clears throat> fixing up my my rough cut and, and working on that because I did the first three cuts of the movie and he just did the, the polish but what he found was that that last scene was good but it was in the wrong order and he took the beginning of the scene and put it at the end and suddenly the scene worked and everything was put together uh, the way I had imagined it so you know really we were rewriting and editing too and moving stuff around. Interesting. You know, now so that, yeah, your, your script is never, ever done. <laughs> I wish it was, but it never is done. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I've done it too where you actually can move things around and get new ideas. You see things and yeah. you always always want to tinker, it seems. <laughs> well, but I hit a point where I want to stop tinkering and finish it. Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. That's, you know, and, and that's you learning that because, you know, a, a couple of friends of mine are writers. I mean – one of them will be talking about the same screenplay for like eight years. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, remember that part in? And it's like, what are you talking about, man? You know, and you have to hit a point where you have to let it go and say, this is as good as it's going to be. And I need to finish this and move on to the next one. And I know there's flaws and mistakes in this, but this is as good as I can make it right now. And the next film will be better. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, and how do you know when that point comes? I'm not sure. You just, I've, for me, I just kind of know this is it. So, so Kelly, so for your, your movies past bird dog, do you still mm-hmm. do the, use the, um, when you're writing the script for those movies, do you actually still do the, use the same method of finding out lo- what locations you have and then basing everything around that? Oh God, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, and part of it, I mean, the Gas Cafe, uh, my second feature, all takes place uh, in a bar. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reason it all takes place in a bar is because a f- couple of friends of mine own a bar, and they let me have it for nothing. We shot at nights after they closed. We had about an eight-hour window every night we'd shoot. Um, and so I couldn't have made that film because we made that film for uh, what do we have for about five thousand uh, dollars, less than five thousand. Uh, and so, you know, you're calling in a lot of favors and you're asking people to work for very little. Um, and that's why one of the things that I always tell people is, you know, if, if you can't pay your crew very much, feed them well. You know, always have lots of really good food. Don't do the pizza thing. Never do the pizza thing. You know, but feed everybody and respect them and make sure that they know. And I keep all of my days on set to somewhere between eight and ten hours. I have never shot on my features. I've never shot over ten hours in a day. You know, that's uh, actually a very good tip, by the way, because uh, just because I we've all seen the 16 hour days and the yeah. hour days. And it's just it just kills your crew from a mental and physical standpoint. Well, and, you know, I'm directing and it kills me, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's and, you know, you see the effect it has on the actors. They're not as sharp. The crew, you know, and people are are moving slower and so your setups are not as quickly and everything now i'm really hardcore about the schedule and making sure that we can get everything done in eight to ten hours uh and like i said knock on wood so far uh, i've been very lucky uh with that and, and one day i think we might have gone ten and a half uh but i apologize like hell to everybody on the set uh which they all thought was pretty funny <laughs> So, so the next phase uh, after you know, if you wrote the script for Bur- uh, for um, Bird Dog, mm-hmm. is you have to start creating the budget. So, did did you have any templates you used to to make the budget, or like a P- like well back then in ninety eight, I don't think you had a PDF, but um, no, so no, I, 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 there's a software I use the uh, AICP. Uh, American, no, the Association of Independent Commercial Producers uh, budgeting program. Uh, I've got that. I've got a couple of budgeting programs that I've picked up over the years. Um, but part of it is when I was writing the script, I was thinking about the budget. And that's what I tell people to do. You know, think about what you can realistically get. Think about your locations. Think about props you're going to need. And, you know, one of the very first things that I do is, like I say, my I make sure that I can get the locations that I've written for. Uh, and then I send out a uh, – back in the day, it was phone calls and letters. Now it's you know mass email to my friends saying, I need these props. I need this. I need this. I need, you know, do you know anybody that has these sorts of things? But I, I try to always write for things that I know I can get because that keeps my budget down. Uh, <clears throat> the, the big thing that I was not expecting with Bird Dog, I was not expecting to shoot 35 millimeter, but – I got an awesome deal on a 35 millimeter camera package, and then, uh, and, and you know, then I talked to uh, the Fuji representative and got an awesome deal on the film, and on and on and on. And but there were times when I was working on this, thinking I don't have this kind of money, and and basically I had a couple of uh, small investors, but most of it was I, I used the money uh, that I made off of Goodwill Hunting. Uh, and the remake of Psycho to finish it. Uh, and that was a huge mistake because I ended up owing the government all sorts of money as far as tax stuff. And it led to, you know, all sorts of other things going on where eventually I had to sell my house and everything I owned to pay off uh, the IRS. And so I don't recommend uh, doing that uh, to uh, filmmakers. You know, figure out how much money you can put together and, and keep your budget there. Uh, a lot of people have made promises to me that if I got this film made, they'd help me get distributors and on and on and on and, and get it seen. And unfortunately, uh, most of them did not keep their promises. And so I had this great film with a huge amount of debt and, uh, you know, no place to show it. And so that and that uh, affected me, I think, financially for quite a few years. I dealt with the IRS for over seven years to clear all that up. I eventually did clear everything up, but like I said, at the cost of my home of 20 years and everything else. Wow. Uh, that, I mean, yeah, that, that is a story, Kelly. Uh, <laughs> that is uh, pretty brutal. Um, 
it, and it was brutal at the time. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, my daughter was pretty upset when I sold the, the house and everything. But, you know, as I told her, and she finally gets it now, uh, you know, it was um, a house is just stuff. You know, I mean, yeah, it was the house that she grew up in and all that stuff. And it was hard to let it go. But the alternative, you know, there was no alternative. And uh, I have not, you know, bought anything since then. I mean, I live in, a, in an apartment. Uh, I've got her in college, you know, so it's it's all worked out. But the the brutalness of dealing with the IRS for seven years, I would not wish that on anybody. <laughs> well, so so after you you know you, you got all that cleared up, how long did you did you actually make a gas cafe in, in uh, during the, that time? Oh God, yeah, I made both gas cafe and, and kicking bird during that time because part of it was I was so frustrated, I was going crazy. We had a ton of screenings uh, with Bird Dog, uh, had screenings in L.A., New York, and and I tell people, you know, remember I was a sound designer on all these big hotshot independent films, so I knew all these people, the distributors. And, you know, they would look at it and say, nice movie, and you'd never hear from them again. Uh, and so that was frustrating. The uh, distributors that I love dealing with, we dealt with a distributor up in Toronto who loved the movie, uh, but said, you know, th we don't know how to market this because there's nobody in it who's famous. You're not famous. You know, what the fuck do we do? And the, the British um, – Distributors were the same way. God, we love this movie, an American film about class and racism and, and and with a good story. But we don't know at this moment how we can distribute it, how we can promote it. Uh, you know, and I had my own answers. Oh, you can do this, you can do this. But they kind of look at you and say, you know, you don't know anything. You're just a filmmaker, which is why I now self-distribute my films, because I think that I have a pretty good handle on who my audience is and what I'm trying to do. Mm hmm yeah, I was talking to a distributor once, and uh, they would always say how it, how hard it is to sell movies that don't have you know the quote unquote nameless actors or a quote unquote nameless director. And uh, she actually went further and said the worst case scenario for her, in her opinion, was a a independent film that's a comedy that has no known actors in it. Yeah, I mean, and comedies, I think, are kind of hard to sell anyway. Um, but this whole notion that you have to have known actors, you know, then you start saying, well, what about Blair Witch Project? What about El Mariachi? What about Clerks? What about – and they always hit you with the same line, oh, well, those are different. Well, how are they different? <laughs> well, they just are. And so it can be done. Part of it is I think distributors have gotten lazy and, you know, you give them a film and it's like, oh, great, there's three famous people in here. I can build the whole campaign around them. Mm -hmm. But if it's a really good story, if it's a really interesting story, well, God, I, you know, how do, we, how do we build a campaign around that? And from what I understand, the Blair Witch guys had their whole website and all that stuff together before the distributor came along. Mm -hmm. And the distributor just kind of jumped onto their website, you know, and the whole idea of promoting this as a documentary. Uh, uh, and, you know, so from what I understand, it was the filmmakers that came up with that whole thing. The uh, distributor saw that it was working and they, and they grabbed it. Yeah, I know that's something else I've also seen today is that a lot of distributors want a lot of work done already mm -hmm. in place. So that way they can just sort of, you know, walk in and say, oh, well, you've got 90 percent done, you know. Right. And another, so, you know, something else I've seen too is, uh, in, in projects, they sort of get a one named actor, and right. they pay that person for one to two days, yeah. And then all of a sudden, you see them on the box cover of the DVD case, you see right. them on the poster, and you know, uh, even you know, friends I know who are around, around here have done the same thing, and they use that one person to promote the movie, and then you you watch the movie, you're like, wait, she, you know, he or she was in it for like ten seconds, and that was it. <laughs> Well, that's the whole thing with uh, – that goes back to Godzilla, you know, the original Godzilla. It's got Raymond Burr in it and if you, know, if you watch the original Godzilla, you'll see that Raymond Burr is rarely in frame with anybody else mm -hmm. because they only had him for like two days and they shot all that stuff after they'd shot the movie. Now, you know, truly, the, the movie is all about Godzilla, and so Raymond Burr is pretty much, you know, who cares? But at the time, I think they thought, well, we need a, an American actor in this thing. Uh, and, and that was, what, late 50s, early 60s. So, you know, it's there, there, there's always been that feeling that the public, people don't want to see a movie where they don't know who it is, you know, who the stars are. But then you have these films that come out all the time that don't have named stars that are good films and do well. What's happening is... You know, as the distributors and everybody have gotten bigger and bigger, they've also gotten lazier. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so it's much easier, as you, you know, as we say, to promote that one actor who's in the film for 10 seconds than to actually set up, you know, a distribution plan that has to do with story. Uh, with my third uh, feature, Kicking Bird, it's about a kid who runs. It's about a lot more than that, but running is a central theme in the movie. And so when we finished the movie, we went out and appealed to runners' magazines, runners' websites, all these people, because it was, you know, running was a pr- such a prominent thing in the film film and that's where our audience was and runners found out that it wasn't really a film about running it was a film about friendship and you know all sorts of other things and so they told friends but our first two write-ups were runners world and runners gazette and runners gazette actually um had two people uh, review it so they had two separate reviews uh, and they were both great but so you know that one started doing really really well off the website because runners were like we want to see this movie about running And so, uh, you know, I tell people, figure out who your audience is while you're writing the script and then go after that audience. You know, with Kicking Bird, there are somewhere between three and four million serious runners in this country. I mean, people who take it very, very seriously. That's a great audience for a small film. If you can tap into one or two percent of that, you know, you will make your money back. And, And we did. We did really well with that film. Oh great! I, I'll have to check that out because I'm because as you know right now I, I just have uh, Bird Dog. I will. I'll, I'll send you the others. Oh, thank don't you. Worry, don't worry about it, man. I'll send it. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, yeah. and, and just you know, uh, as we were talking about Kelly, with casting, you know, uh, as we we're talking about you know named actors and etc. You know, how did you cast for Bird Dog? Those are all actors who do a lot of theater, and actually, some of them. One of the fellows uh, is now in. Uh, uh, the uh, the TV series Grimm, um, but these are all actors, local actors that I knew. Uh, none of them are my friends. <laughs> I always tell people that, uh, except for the uh, the guy who sings the opening. That's my lawyer. Uh, but uh, for the most part, I see a lot of theater, mm-hmm. and because I love theater, but I also love theater actors because they're concerned about their craft. They're concerned about becoming really, really good actors. Uh, And so, and I know a couple of uh, theater directors and casting people now. And so when I write a script, but now uh, after Bird Dog, I write uh, uh, scripts for uh, roles with certain actors that I know in mind. There's a few people in uh, Bird Dog that have been in all my films. Oh, that's Uh, Yeah, but, uh, you know, I tell filmmakers, go see theater, go watch plays, look at the acting, look at the actors. You know, most of us don't have friends that are good actors, and so don't put your friends into a movie (laughs) if you can avoid it. Because, you know, you might think that they're hilarious, but will an audience think that they're hilarious or good? And and also, we've always seen where you put a camera in front of them, and suddenly they're not so hilarious anymore. They (laughs) they wouldn't, they, they freak out. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, and it's, they can be funny in a barroom setting or at a cafe, whatever it is. But now you have to give them lines. Now they have to read these things, and you know they're, they're, they can't do it. A lot of them. I mean, there there are some certainly who I, I think can get away with it. The other thing is, you know, I appeared in all my old short films because they were about my life, uh, and they were kind of pseudo documentary things, although they were written. But um, I would never be in any of my features. I do not, uh, you know, and I shouldn't say that. Now Ever. But I love actors. I respect actors. I am not an actor. Mm-hmm. And I know my limitation. And how do you direct and act in something? I mean, you know, Woody Allen gets away with it and a few other people, but most people are not that good. We're not that, you know, we, we can't be doing, wearing 15 hats at the same time and be good at all 15. Yeah, uh, there was an acting uh, teacher I was talking to, and he always said, how do actors you know, because if an actor ever makes a movie, they always inevitably cast themselves in a role. And he said, "How do they actually check what was going on? Do they actually have to run behind the camera and then see the playback right. monitor and run back into the into frame?" And yeah, yeah, I'm I'm totally with you. And it's and it's it's I don't like um, directors who uh, shoot their own stuff too, who do P, DP their own stuff because I have shot, I can shoot, <clears throat> but. It's really hard to, to, you know, your job when you're on set as the director is only one thing, and that's getting the performances out of the actors. All the technical stuff, the lighting, all that other stuff should already be in place. You know, you have a crew for a reason, and you shouldn't be moving lights around. You, shouldn't, you should be, <clears throat> excuse me, with the actors. 
talking with them and making sure they're ready for the performance. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so to be, to to try to check that, you know, you're keeping people in frame and the shot looks good and all that stuff and direct. um, I just, I, I don't see it. I don't see people doing a good job of it for the most part. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, And everybody who's listening to this interview are going to think, yeah, I'm the exception, you know? (laughs) Uh, And and like I said, I would never shoot. uh, You know, I've shot a lot of uh, my documentary work. Uh, but for the most part, usually with documentaries, I'll roll sound and have somebody else shoot so that I can ask questions and be the location sound person. And that's just for docs. Mm-hmm. So so when, obviously, as you said before, when you were casting and as you go to the next step, which is, you know, you're you're now getting ready for production. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously, as you said you, you rehearse with your actors a lot. So that way, when you, know, you finally get on set, you know, we have time now. Is is uh, we've managed time as well as possible as, we, as well as we possibly can, right. because you know we've all been there where you get onto a film set and sometimes they haven't rehearsed much at all with their actors and it shows. It absolutely shows, and I approach the acting and all that stuff like we're doing a play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean we do the big read through and everything else, but then when I have scenes that I. I, I are a problem, you know, I will bring the actors in for those scenes and, and we'll work and work and work on it. Uh, and I, you know, I don't think you can rehearse too much, especially when, you know, as I tell people, well, as soon as we step on the set, you know, the cash register is running, you know, cha-ching, cha-ching, you're spending money. So you better know exactly what you want and exactly what you need. Uh, and it, it's also a way of respecting the cast and the crew's time. There's nothing worse than stepping onto a set and thinking, Okay, what do I want to do here? How do I want to shoot this? And the cast and crew sees that, and they're standing around like, you know, let's go, let's go. What are you waiting for? Yeah. I said, like, well, I don't know how I want to shoot this. And it's like, oh, man, you should have known that a long time ago. Yeah, storyboarded the hell out of it. And, right. And, right. And know your locations. I will visit my loca- locations two or three different times uh, without the cast. Without, I mean, I'll bring my DP sometimes, but I'll check them out because I want to see what they look like or sound like at different times of day. Mm. Uh, and figure out which is going to be the best time of day because scheduling everything is is really important too. Yes. What time of day do you want to be at some place or night or you know all of those things? And it, it's why for me, since I have so little money, pre production is so important uh, because you know, like I said, when we're on set. I want the actors to be having a good time. I want the crew to be having a good time, working hard and being organized. But there's no yelling. There's no, you know, it's a real uh, relaxed atmosphere. But we're working our butts off Mm -hmm. Uh, because if they sense that and they sense that you respect them, when you want to do something else, they'll be back. They'll be more than happy to help you. And, you know, that's we all want to make multiple films. We don't want to just make one film and burn all of our bridges. (laughs) But it doesn't seem that way sometimes with some filmmakers you meet. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. And crew people. I know a lot of crew people say they'll never work with so-and-so again. They were disorganized. They were this. You know, we did those 16, 18-hour days. And they served nothing but pizza for eight days. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, you know, I I feel for the crews. I, I respect the crews. I love the crews. Uh, I, I've, I'm able to work with a lot of great people. And, you know, I want to keep it that way. Yeah. And once you find a team, I've noticed this too. I, I you know, as I was starting off about, you know, f- uh, five or so years ago, mm-hmm. I, I noticed, you know, like, like Tim Burton, for instance, works a lot with the same crew, same oh, yeah. actors, everything. And I always wondered why. And now I understand why. <laughs> you know, there is a comfort level. And I always tell people every now and again, you got to throw a wrench into the works for yourself because you don't want to get too comfortable. Yeah. Uh, and so there are times when I might change up a position or whatever, but I've been working a lot with the same people over and over again. And, you know, if I'm going to use somebody different on something, I always, you know, talk to them and say, it's got nothing to do with you. I'm looking for a different look. I'm looking for a different, you know, whatever it is. Um, but I don't just say, oh, yeah, you know, you're not going to work this time. You know, and so it's, you know, because you want to keep those relationships because, you know, you bring in somebody uh, and they turn out to be a disaster. Well, you want to call your your former person back, you know, and say, I'm sorry, I strayed. I didn't mean to have an affair with another production designer. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it happens sometimes and you just sort of get that one person and they, they, they seem like they're going to work out and then you get on set and it just um, all hell breaks loose. And that, that happened to me on, on, a, on a TV pilot we shot. 
Mm-hmm. And um, it just, yeah, we, we have not, I have not spoken to that person. He hasn't spoken to me since. So, you know, it happens. Oh, yeah. Well, a friend of mine, um, he fired his DP the night before they started shooting. Because he suddenly realized as they were going through this stuff, he you know he'd been having problems with the DP anyway. But all of a sudden, he realized, well, the DP wants to be a director and thinks they're a director, but I'm the director. Mm-hmm. And so, and it took him, and the DP was supplying all of his own camera equipment, all that stuff. And so, you can't fire the person and say, by the way, can we use your gear? Um, but you know, his actors, everybody was getting ready to shoot the next day, and he went, and then he pushed his production back. I think it was about three days, and brought another DP and found one who could shoot on such short notice. Um, but it was the smartest thing he did, because especially as a director, you cannot be fighting with your DP. And, uh, you know, because the cast gets it, the crew gets it. And so I always tell people, even if you've rehearsed with an actor and you suddenly realize, you know what, we're having problems here, get rid of them. Do it in the nicest way possible, which is never possible. But, you know, because if you if you're getting bad feelings before you start shooting, it's only going to get worse on the set. Yes. You know, the other thing that I do, because and I've heard this, too, uh, when some people have a little bit of nudity in one of their films or whatever, that the actors say, no problem, no problem, no problem. They don't want to rehearse those scenes. They don't want to rehearse. And then it comes time to shoot the scene. It's like, oh, no, we're not doing nudity. Mm -hmm. And and that's a tricky, tricky thing, because first off, in my mind, it has to fit the story. It it cannot be gratuitous. You know, and a couple of times I've had nudity in my films. It's, It's for a very good reason. And, you know, and it needs to be there. It's integral to the story, I believe. And I convince the actors that I let the actors know ahead of time, hey, there is nudity. And if you don't want to do it, walk now. I mean, this is the time. And I will rehearse those scenes with nudity by myself. Well, not by myself, because I always have if it's if it's with females, I always have another female in the room with me. Because I do not ever want to be accused of, you know, being a lecherous bastard. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, so I'll do that in rehearsals. I'll check this stuff. And then when we shoot that stuff, it's a closed set. It's usually the sound person, the DP, and myself. And I don't run the video monitor mm. for those, you know, to make the actors comfortable. But, you know, and we've never had a problem with it. But I work really hard at making sure that everybody is comfortable with it and they know that it's integral to the story. And, you know, the biggest thing is getting everybody comfortable and having them trust you. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, getting everyone comfortable on the set also I, I've noticed that is is key too um, when filming yeah. things and just making sure everyone's on the same page and there's a and, and there's a group you know group dynamic there's you know that mm-hmm. you know, this we're all working together and this isn't just you know someone's project all alone if you know what I mean right well you know in Bird Dog the guy who plays Earl the old guy at the car lot he um, <clears throat> he's been in Woody Allen films he's been in all sorts of different stuff over the years and he retired to Portland and I hadn't realized he'd been in all those things until I found out later and he did stuff on Broadway but uh, on one of the films there was uh, we did you know behind the scenes little making of and somebody interviewed him when I wasn't around and he gave me the highest compliment he said uh, that my crew were the only crew he's seen who works as hard and is as professional as the, as the crew that I use uh, was Woody Allen Oh, wow. And he said, you know, your, Kelly's crew knows what they're doing. They know what they need to do. They're total professionals, and they get it done quickly and efficiently. And it's a pleasure to work with these people, and they're all friendly while they're doing it. And when I heard that, and I didn't hear it for a couple of months after we'd shot, when they finally showed me this footage, like, wow, you know, that's very cool. And, and I take that personally, and I want my crew to take that personally too. I mean, that's a great compliment. Yeah, that is a very high compliment. So yeah. does Woody use the same crew on every, uh, on every shoot? I think he used to. Now that he's shooting in Europe, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, because I'm not watching the credits. As, I'm not seeing his stuff as much. Uh, I'm, I'm finding as I'm getting older that I'm seeing fewer and fewer movies. But that's because I want to read. I want to write. I want to hike. I want to do, you know, all sorts of other things. I, I don't own a television. You know, I can watch. I stream Netflix uh, for films. and I'll go to the theaters. But, you know, I just uh, when you hit a certain age, you want to just keep working. And work. I, I think I'm doing more work and enjoying my life in other ways and uh, and, and watching movies when I want. But like I said, television, I, I just I've never been all that interested in it. Well, you know, that that's actually becoming the norm is that people are moving away with less from TVs and just either having computers or tablets or your phone because you can watch everything on there. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I said, I don't, I wouldn't, oh man, I don't see how you can watch on your phone. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> I, you know, I've got the smartphone and all that stuff, but that's just too small for me. I, I've watched a few things on my tablet, but for the most part, I have a large monitor that I use when I'm editing and my laptop is hooked up to that. Excuse me, to that. And so I watch stuff on my big monitor. I still want to see a, a big size picture and I run everything through a small mix board and speakers so that I can get, try to get decent sound anyway. It's coming through the internet, so how good can it be? But. <laughs> So, so uh, Kelly, you know, what was your, you know, best day on the set of, of Bird Dog, and what was your worst day on the set of Bird Dog? Just, just for, you know, for for experience yeah. purposes, you know what I mean? So that things that have taught you, you know, right? Lessons. Um, you know, they, they were all great days, uh, and part of it was because it was such a new experience. You know, you never get to repeat making that first film, uh, and so yeah, I guess one of the problems we had one day. Uh, and, it, and it wasn't a, a worst day by any means, but it was, um, I noticed my producer and my production manager and the assistant director were huddled up talking constantly. And I come over and say, what's going on? You don't need to know. You don't need to know. And it's like, oh no, I need to know. This is, you know, this is my movie. This is, I need to. And finally, one of them said, you know, we're shooting that scene in two days at the bank and the guy you cast to play the bank guy, uh, isn't available. He's, he's in LA. He's, uh, doing some casting work or auditions or whatever. And he just called us and said he can't be here in, the, in two days and to rearrange the schedule uh, and he can come back in like 10 days or whatever. And so we have to rearrange the schedule to work around his. And I said, really? And they said, yes, yeah, so we're trying to you know change the schedule. And we're trying to shuffle. And I said, stop, don't do that. And I was like, but he was that. And I said, well, no, he was my second choice. This was my first choice was a was an actor who couldn't make it on the original time we were going to shoot. Call him. See if he's available in two days to do the scene, because I really wanted to work with him and he really wanted to work with me. And let's just, you know, see if he's available. If he's, we'll shoot it with this guy and to hell with the other guy. I'm not going to rearrange everything, you know, for an actor who's only in one scene. And uh, they called uh, my my first choice. He's like, oh, God, yeah, I'm available. I'm available. Boom, fired the other guy and shot the scene at the same point in the schedule with the actor that I truly wanted to work with. Uh, so I don't know whether that's a good or bad day. It was, you know, I mean, everybody was all freaked out about it. Uh, everybody except me once they told me what was going on. It's like, that's an easy one. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, for me, I mean, they're all good days. You're shooting, you know. Uh, I've always told people, you know, uh, shooting a film is like the great, the greatest act of rebellion you can have. You know, I mean, you're playing with your own rules and it's uh, I on all of the films. I don't know if I can give you a day that I had that was a bad day. Uh, and, it's, and part of it is because I've written the script. This is, you know, this is this thing that I've been working on for so long and it's coming to life. Mm -hmm. How could anything be bad? <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you have things that are like minor screw ups and all that stuff. But, you know, uh, yeah, as far as so far, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know if I've ever had a bad day on a set. Uh, I have on working on commercials. Uh, when the agency becomes overpowering. Uh, and that's why I don't do commercials anymore either. Uh, but when you're making your own stuff, if you're organized and ha you know, have surrounded yourself with good people, there are no bad days, man. Yeah, that's good advice. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's but, true. But, but it's, it, it, it's about the people you surround yourself with. But this is, you know, <clears throat> this is the movie business. where This is entertainment. Man, if we're not having fun, what's the point? Yeah, that's very you true. Know, not, we're not curing cancer. And so why be all serious? Why get all pissed off? Why get all, you know, I got angry once on a set and I walked off. And part of it was because everybody was, you know, the, the people were working and doing all sorts of stuff, but they weren't setting up the scene the way I wanted it set up. And I kept saying, no, that's not what we want. That's what, but for whatever reason, nobody was listening to me. And so I just walked away. And I went and got a cup of coffee on the corner, and some of the AD finally finds me. I was like, Where, what are you doing? And I said, I'm waiting until everybody gets everything set up, and then I'm going to go back in there and tear it all down because this is not what I wanted. This is not what it says in the script. This is not – I don't know what's going on there. And the AD felt so bad. He felt like he failed mm -hmm. because he had the crew working on all this other stuff. But what he had them working on was not my vision for the scene. Mm -hmm. And so we walked back up there and everybody's like, oh, God, he's mad. He's mad. And I was like, no, I'm not mad. It's this is how I want this. Now let's do this. 
And so there was no tension on the set. I mean, there might have been some tension when I turned around and walked away, but I, I knew I had to walk off the set. Otherwise, I was going to get mad. And, you know, as a director, you should never lose it on the set. If you lose it, then you've lost control of your set. Mm. And you can't, you cannot lose control of the set. I've seen advertising people blow up and I've seen some directors who yell and scream and that's just not me. But when they do, it's like, then the crew fears them Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and people don't work as efficiently or they work as fast as they can to get the hell out of there. And and that's not conducive to doing good work either. I mean, you know, there is, um, you know, there is a chain of command and, you know, as the director and, and since I'm also my own producer now, um, you know, I, I'm at the top of that chain. Uh, but I want people to respect and listen to me, not be afraid of me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's a good point because, you know, we've all seen the director who screams and yells and, uh, yeah. yeah and then, you know, generally then it's just sort of, that starts to wind down to, you know what I mean? And then eventually, yeah, and then I, I've seen crew who just generally seen a director yells and stuff like that, and they generally yeah. finally they, they just sort of stop listening to him at, at all because right. they, do, they they do the job well he yells they do the job bad he yells so right. if, what what you know why even bother what's the point yeah absolutely absolutely and you know the other thing is I you know these are ultimately a lot of the crew members and stuff like that they are my friends. Mm-hmm. You know, the people I've worked with for years and, and even if they're not my friends and my colleagues and I want them to want to continue working with me, you know, and so and like I said, it's, it's all about and I and in the first book, I talk a whole lot about treating the crew with respect, having them in on some of the decisions or making sure that they know what decisions have been made. You know, so that everybody's on the same page all the time. And if you do that and feed the crew well and, and genuinely, like I say, respect them, they're going to they're going to work their asses off for you, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I still help out friends on other films, too. And uh, and then mostly I'll help out in post. And I've done sound design for a lot of friends of mine who don't have a budget for sound, but they've been helping and supporting me for years. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll do the sound on your movie. No problem. You know, and, I'll, and I do it a lot of times. It, I shouldn't say this, but a lot of times for my good friends, I've, I, you know, I've done the sound on a bunch of films for, for nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's because these are people who have been so, so supportive of me over the years that how could I not, when they're asking me a favor, I've asked them favors. Why, why wouldn't I help them out? Yeah. I mean, that, that is incredibly generous, you know, and that's good about creating relationships and now – um, yeah, and it's funny because I don't look at it as generous at all. I mean, I look at it as you know, you're you're, you're paying them back, you're paying it forward, you're paying, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, you just it, it's you know, it comes back to that whole thing: treat people the way you want to be treated. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so yeah, like I said, I never look at it as generous. I look at it as what's well, the thing? It's what one should do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's a great attitude to have, Kelly. I mean. Especially an independent film, you know, we got to help each other out. Big time, oh, big time. And I said, you know, when I've seen people have been working on their films for years, and you know, they're this close to getting it done, but they can't quite get this. Well, I don't have any money to give them to help them, you know, get it finished. But what I do have is, you know, some expertise. And so, a lot of times, if I can help with that, then it's like, boom, yeah, let's go for it. Mm. And, and you know, um, just you know, as you took. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. It's a bird dog. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. So it's like you got bird dog. You know, as you finally finish shooting that, mm-hmm. you know, you know, how did you try to distribute that? I know we touched on that a little earlier, but how did, could you go about doing all that? Well, the, the the deal with bird dog, which is different than the other, the later films, was that I really thought I was going to get a distribution deal because all these friends had said they'd help, you know, and they were all well connected. And when we didn't get a deal, I mean, Miramax sat on my my only print of the film for uh, six months. You know, we want to look at it. We want to look at it. We're real interested. We're we're real interested. But you know, shit. After about three months, if you haven't seen it, you're probably not that interested. And eventually, you know, I asked them to send me the print back and, you know, and I was told, by, oh, you're making a big mistake. And it's like, no, it's been sitting there for all this time. They're not excited about it. They're not all, you know, they probably asked to see it out of an obligation because they knew me from Goodwill Hunting and all that other stuff. Um, but basically what I realized is that I was going to have to set up my own 
distribution thing around that and then around Gas Cafe, which came uh, two years later. Because I spent a year trying to get a distributor for Bird Dog. Uh, and so that's when I started booking my tours. And literally, I would book the film myself into these small art house theaters or at colleges and universities. And I threw my, my dog and all my stuff into my van and, you know, hit the road for two months. And showed, you know, the films wherever it could. And I always tell people, you know, I was like a punk band on the road without the punks or the music. I mean, it was a total DIY thing. And I, I booked wherever I could. I did the promotions, you know, and, and, and I got the film out there and I got it seen. It did well in the film festival circuit. In fact, uh, the year that I finished it, it was the opening night film for the Sao Paulo Film Festival, uh, and the reviews were great and all, and you know, very prestigious festival. So that was great. So I knew it was a good film, uh, but you know, like I said, nobody knew how to market it, and I learned how to market it by calling. You know, I, I and I showed it in Tulsa and Omaha, and you know, I hit all the smaller places because then I'm news. I can show up, or I can I call these newspapers ahead of time when I had the bookings down. And say, you know, hi, this is Kelly Baker. I'm a filmmaker. I used to do, you know, sound designer on this and this, but now I've got my own film. And I'm sitting here in my van with my dog showing my film all over the country. And boy, have I got a story for you. And they're like, you know, what's the story? What's the story? So, you know, I tell them about what I was doing. And I get a full write up in the newspaper before I got to town or the day that I would get to town. And a lot of people would see that. So I wouldn't have to take out advertising, which I couldn't afford anyway, because I was able to place articles about me in the movie and, you know, and come on down to the theater and meet this crazy filmmaker or meet the angry filmmaker. And you can even pet his dog, uh, you know, cause the dog went everywhere with me in those days. Uh, and, and that generated a lot of buzz. It, you know, uh, you, it's kind of rare now to see somebody go to town to town to do that. And that's a good, and you know, I was actually talking to a fellow filmmaker of mine and he was actually saying he would like to do that one day. Is to is to do that what they used to do. They used to do that and right. take yeah. the reel, but in this case it would probably be a, a hard drive or you know. Right. But what a, yeah. Yeah, and then you go to every independent film or independent theater that's left and just try to actually show it and just you know tour and and now obviously you have to with the advent of the internet you can now announce a tour beforehand and you know make a whole right. landing page for it and. Yeah. I did an entire uh, three-week tour of the UK using MySpace. How long ago was that? <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I toured uh, with my films for eight years. Uh, and a lot of times I'd go out uh, twice, uh, twice a year. When it first started, I was going out for two months in the fall and two months in the spring. After about four years, I stopped doing the spring tour um, just because the weather was so unreliable. And what you find is you're prepping for the next tour instead of prepping for your next movie. Uh, but yeah, for eight years, I, my van has, uh, 240,000 miles on it. Uh, and, and most of that is just from crisscrossing the country. Uh, but like I said, I did Europe, uh, one big thing cause they were doing a retrospective of my work in Scotland. So I use that as a, as a way to go all over the UK and show my films. Uh, and it's hard work. It is really, really hard work. And some nights, you know, the dog and I would sleep in the van in a Walmart parking lot. Some nights we'd have a hotel or a motel, you know, and, uh, you know, you really learn the country and you learn and you're there to meet people who are coming to see your work and to hear their responses is, is it's a great thing for a filmmaker. But, you know, I developed <clears throat> I developed an audience, uh, a fan base, if you will, for my films. But as I used to say, you know, I played shows where four people would be there or less. And then I would do shows where there'd be 50 or 60 people. Uh, and, and the biggest thing is, and I always tell people, I do the same thing for four people that I do for 60 or 100. You know, you just got to keep, you know, and you give it all every night when you're out on the road, which is exhausting. Mm hmm. Um, but I learned so much about promotion and marketing and, you know, I have a huge following, you know, luckily for me, I have a huge following now on the internet, but so much of that was I would have internet signup sheets at all my gigs, you know, here, give me your email address and, uh, and, and I promise you. Yeah. And I, and I, and I, you know, I say, I promise you, I won't sell, you know, the email addresses and I won't hit you with a bunch of spam. You hear from me every couple of months about whatever it is that I'm doing. And, you know, I built up a huge, huge list that way. Um, yeah. And, and that's, that's the new thing now, even with, you know, social media, it's, it's great, but having that email address is key. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. and, and always looking and, and you know and, and there's always different plans to how to actually you know promote yourself get email addresses to you know parlay it into something else um, you know I, I usually get about an email a day from mm-hmm. some, from a seminar or somebody just saying hey I'll show you how to make a marketing funnel online and, right you know, all that stuff. <laughs> so yeah oh yeah, but, yeah, oh, yeah. But, uh, I mean I, I exactly what you mean Kelly now now with um, with with Netflix and you know, even like YouTube now because YouTube is right. even changing and where they want to have you know a paid service or even like a tip right. jar so you can show it if you actually put your film up there. Right, uh, Vimeo is doing the same thing. I'm trying to get. I've been trying to interview someone from Vimeo for my uh, new book, and they just will not return my emails. It must be the uh, finger that's my logo. You know, kind of turns them off. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, it's. But Vimeo is doing that. I think it's two hundred dollars a year as a flat, and you can put your films up there and and you know use PayPal and and all that stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of great things now and I'm looking for, you know, what is the new interesting thing? What is the new way to, you know, to get your work out? Um, and I'm always talking to other filmmakers about that. <clears throat> um, cause you know, technology changes all the time and I am not an expert in any of this by any means, you know, it's all been trial and error. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I'm always trying to learn. Well, I think you've done a pretty good job because uh, I mean, you got the books. And, you know, these books are actually very good. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, but you know, you, you can never stop learning. You always have to keep learning something. Absolutely. Else. You know, and I try to tell uh, film students when I teach and do lectures and stuff. You know, a lot of people come in and they think that they know it all. You know, and it's like uh, you can't really teach me anything because you know I've been watching movies for years, so I know how to make them. And I try to tell them I've been doing this for over thirty years, and I don't know it all. So how could you? And if you say you know everything about this stuff, and you know, then to me that's like okay, you've stopped learning, which means you 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 probably can't tell me anything that I don't already know. But you're not pushing yourself, and you're not growing as an artist. And ultimately, I like to think that I'm an artist, and I always want to keep growing. I always want to keep learning. I want new experiences. Uh, that's crucial for because that comes out in your work. Yeah. And yeah, and, and you know, uh, just just you know, going around, you see how many different experiences you can learn from from other people, and you know, how, all the new. Uh, and and now with the ever evolving uh, technology of filmmaking, you mm-hmm. know, you always have to learn something new now. Whether it's a new camera that's coming out, whether it's a new editing system, because uh, Adobe now their whole system is on the Creative Cloud now. So yeah, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, like I said, I don't. You know, I'm still running mass quantities of hard drives and all that stuff because. I don't want to put my stuff up where it's hackable. And it's not to say people can't get into my hard computer and go after my hard drives. The cloud just frightens me a little bit, you know, because I feel like you don't have any control of your stuff. And, you know, we're already hit with piracy all the time. Mm. Uh, and, and, and so, like I said, you know, maybe I'm paranoid, maybe I'm old fashioned, um, but I'm not ready to surrender to the cloud. Um, you know, and I use Dropbox and I use all sorts of stuff like that. But right now, like I said, the majority of my work, I still keep on these hard drives. And the only time the hard drives are plugged into the, uh, my computer is when I'm actually working on something. Uh, and so it's, you know, they're not just plugged in all the time, you know, 24 seven, I unplug stuff to the computer all the time. And, And like I said, maybe I'm just this paranoid freak. Um, but you know, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just, and I hold the copyrights to all my work, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's what I will tell filmmakers is don't give your stuff away. If a distributor wants to sign you, you need to have a commitment from them that they're going to spend money and truly promote your film. They're not going to give you any money because they don't do that anymore. But you want to know what their budget is for promoting your film. You want to know where they're going to send it, who they're going to go after. You know, you need to ask all sorts of questions. And if they have sub distributors because they handle just the educational or they just handle television, but they're going to sell, you know, they can work with people who, you know, sell, uh, sell in other media. Well, what is your deal with them? Because if I've got a 75, 25 split with you and the way that works is they keep 75 i get 25 uh what's your deal with you know a sub distributor you're using is that a 50 50 split for you guys so that i'm going to get 25 percent of your 50 percent on a on a tv sale or whatever it is which means my margins are getting smaller and smaller and smaller 
Um, but as a filmmaker, you need to know those things and you need to know how much money you're making and, and where it's going and what fees you are paying to the distributors and stuff if you go with the distributor. You know, if you self distribute, you have to learn even more about business uh, because you're the one who's, you know, driving, driving the ship here. Uh, and I, too many filmmakers say, oh, I don't want to learn about business. I just want to make films. If you want to make films and keep making films and making a living, you have to learn about business. I didn't want to learn about business either. I now know more about business than I ever thought I would. But it's because if I didn't know about business, I couldn't do this full time. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. very true. Yeah. And so I, you know, and I always tell people, if you take a business class at a community college, whatever it is, and just learn some of the basics and then throw a lot of that out because our business isn't like anybody else's, uh, you know, the, the whole key here is to be able to create stuff that you care about and make a living through it. And I'm not saying get filthy rich. I'm saying make a living. You know, I'm not rich by any means, but this is all I've done for 30 plus years. And, and, you know, it's been, it's a, it's a great fucking lifestyle. You know, I've got a kid in college. I, you know, I'm able to pay all the bills, you know, can I go and retire tomorrow? No, of course not. But then again, you know, people say, when, you know, when are you going to retire? I would say, well, listen, if I retire, how do I want to spend my retirement? I want to spend my retirement, you know, writing books and making movies. Hey, wait a minute. I do that now. So I retire. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, but um, it's learn learn as much as you can about the business of filmmaking. If for nothing else, then you won't get screwed that way, or you get screwed less often. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, truly, you know, I still get screwed on occasion too, uh, because there's always new wrinkles to how somebody wants to, you know, get your work or whatever. But you know, retain the copyrights to all your work. Don't give that stuff away. And if you're going to sign a contract, it has to have a time limit. And there has to be, you know, and they always want to do these well, and it'll automatically in seven years roll over again, unless you say something in 90 days, uh, you know, within 90 days. And it's like, well, then I need to be able to know when that 90 days is occurring, because if I'm not happy with you, I want to change the parameters. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I've done that. But I said, I I think only only one of my films now is signed with a distributor. That's an educational distributor. And they've had it for some 20 some odd years, but I also have it as well. And I've made more money distributing it myself than they ever made for me. They, they made a shitload of money too. I just never saw it. And it was all perfectly legal. (laughs) So, so Kelly, to, to, you know, to summarize, you're making your, your first movie bird, uh, bird dog, it, you know, you, you took the script, you, you based it around things that you knew you had, mm-hmm. um, you, you know, you budgeted, you know, and you called as many favors as you could, um, you know, uh, to, to actually shoot the movie, or sorry, to, to cast it, uh, you know, exactly, you use theater actors, um, yeah. and then obviously to, um, to shoot the movie, you, you did, you know, everything you can, a lot of planning was involved, and yeah. the distribution, you know, you basically, you know, you, you try to take it out and self-distribute it and show it in a film festival, so... Um, you know, just to anyone taking notes, cause I, I, you know, just to summarize, uh, <laughs> we've been talking about a lot of stuff, man. Yeah. Just to summarize everything. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Kelly, you, you, you know, we spent over an hour together. I know you're busy and I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, no so, but I do want to touch on one thing is you have, uh, two books now, your two books that we were talking about are being translated to Chinese. Yeah. Pretty cool. Huh? <laughs> yeah. It is very cool. <laughs> yeah. I was approached by a Chinese publisher because apparently there was a, a film instructor in, at Beijing university who read my books and went to them and said, you know, you should, you should get these and, uh, and translate them. They would help our students here, our filmmakers here. Um, you know, the, the books have been a wonderful thing because, and I, and I'm really honest about this. I think the opening line in the first book is, what is it? It's, uh, I'm the poster boy for bad decision making in the independent film world. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've fucked up a lot. And I'm hoping that if people read the books, they'll see where I made mistakes and they'll go off and make new and different mistakes. They won't repeat what I've done. Um, but, you know, it's uh, I had a blast writing the books uh, and I hope that filmmakers get something out of them. I mean, that's why I did it. I didn't do it so that I could become an author. I did it because, you know, uh, if I didn't know a lot of the stuff when I was starting out or even in the midst of my career, there were probably a lot of other filmmakers who don't either. And so if I can help uh, filmmakers in any way by learning from my experiences, I mean, that's that's why I wrote the books. And the books are available on my website in English. <laughs> 
uh, angryfilmmaker.com. Uh, they can go up there and buy them. Very reasonably, very reasonably priced. That's my plug. And help me keep my kid in school by buying books. <laughs> I am definitely going to put a link to those in the show notes uh, cool. to each of your books and your site. And also, obviously, the Bird Dog, the movie we've been talking about. Right. Um, so people can check it out, and it's on DVD right now. And, uh, you know, uh, is there anything else you, you would like to, d- to discuss in closing? Uh, you know, any projects you're working on? Um, I'm trying to finish with a film that I actually started 28 years ago. Uh, it's a documentary on Kay Boyle, the most dangerous woman in America. Uh, I'm editing, and, and actually that's why I'm going to D.C. Uh, in two days, because I'm doing a bunch of research there for archival footage, and I'm speaking at a film festival. But, um, you know, watch out for Dangerous Kay Boyle. You can go to my site. We're still fundraising to try to get it finished. Um, but this is a 28-year uh, passion project that uh, I've been told from the beginning was pretty much unfundable. And I started crowd crowdfunding this film in 1986, uh, picking up money here and there uh, to uh, get the thing shot. Uh, we have nonprofit status so that if they do want to donate something, it's a tax deduction, and you get your name in the movie. I mean, all the, all, all the usual stuff. Um, but I think my advice to filmmakers and, and everybody out there is if this is your passion, if this is what you want to do, don't let anybody talk you out of it. Work really, really hard to stay out of debt. You know, don't buy all sorts of new stuff because then you become a slave to the debt. Uh, but don't don't give up. This is, you know, what we do is not easy. It, it's, it takes a lot of work, a lot of dedication, but it's incredibly rewarding. Uh, and so, you know, figure out what it is you want to do and go for it. Uh, and just remember, you know, don't have a plan B, because if you have a plan B, you're going to fall back on it. And if you say, no, this is what I'm doing and, you know, Let's go for 150%. Hopefully you'll succeed, but it'll take years. And it'll be a great, great ride. Mine has been. Uh, uh, Kelly, thank you so much. That, that was uh, I mean, amazing advice. And um, again, thank you very much for coming on, Kelly. I, you know, I, I, know um, I appreciate it, and uh, I know everyone listening out appreciates it too. Uh, so again, everyone, it's angryfilmmaker.com. Uh, Kelly, are you on Facebook and Twitter? I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Facebook is Kelly Baker, uh, and there's an Angry Filmmaker uh, page on uh, uh, Facebook as well. And Twitter is the Kelly Baker, uh, and also I think it's Mr. Angry's. Yeah, you know, there's a Mr. Angry something that somebody else put uh, and and uh, uh, put up there for me and then handed it to me. I can't remember the name of that one. That Twitter <laughs> handle. Oops. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So check me out on Facebook. Check me. Check out my site uh, and my email address. And I tell this to people. My email is bother me at angryfilmmaker dot com. If you have a question, you know, send it to me. I mean, a specific question. Don't say, how do you make a movie? Um, but you know, I, I do try to respond to emails if I can, if they're an honest an earnest question. But please respect my time uh, the way I respect other people's times. Uh, you know, it's I try to get back to people when they ask me a, a genuine, sincere question. It might take days for me to get back because, you know, uh, I'm a one man show anymore. But, you know, I, I'm happy to hear from people. If they just got to make a movie, you just look back to this podcast. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, talk to Dave. Call Dave. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll say, uh, just buy Kelly's book. <laughs> well, actually, before they send me their questions, they should buy my books and my DVDs so that they, then they'll know everything and they won't need to ask me. Exactly. And then it's more specific rather than a broad stroke of, uh, right. so, you right. know, I need 20 grand for a movie. How do I do that? Yeah. <laughs> if I knew that, I'd be doing it. <laughs> but uh, but you know, Kelly, thanks again for coming on. Uh, thanks. Thank you for listening. It's uh, you can find me at davebolus dot com. My Twitter handle is dave underscore bolus, and I'm on Facebook also dave dot uh, you know, as an extension. And um, please feel free to sign up for my newsletter. I'm trying to to actually grow that uh, because people keep missing articles and stuff that I post, and this is like my one. Uh, you know, I email everyone you know, probably once a week at most, maybe, you know, uh, maybe a little less. And then I, I usually put some articles I find that are pretty cool, a link to the latest podcast. And, you know, uh, that way you can see everything in one, one place because I'll, I'll usually post something, Kelly, and then everyone goes, I never saw that. What do you mean? And then, you know, I was like, yeah, you should see this, you know. But so, 
but yeah, uh, and and you know, again, I, I don't spam anybody. So Kelly, uh, thank you very much for everything, and you know, I wish you the best of luck with uh, your latest project. And uh, look, at, you know, there, we do have Chinese listeners, so they can actually look for your book being re- uh, being released in Chinese. Yeah, that, I think they told me it'll be about eighteen months to do the translation, so it'll be out in either two thousand fifteen or early two thousand sixteen. Cool, excellent. Cool. Thanks, man. Uh, you have a terrific rest of your day. You too, buddy. And stay angry. <laughs> Thanks, man. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.